Okay, you calling from the 216611. And uh, Mr. Kosak, uh, your appearance, or uh, actually, Mr. Keese, first your appearance. Thank you, Judge. Mark Keese, not behalf of the people. Once again, Scott Kozak on behalf of Mr. Crumble. Ms. Hatton? Sorry. Yes, Your Honor, Nadine Hatton. I was um, formerly appointed to Mr. Ethan um, Crumbly as his juvenile attorney. Thank you. And Mr. Crumbly, could you state your full name for us, please? Um, Ethan Robert Crumbly. Thank you. Mr. Crumbly, at any time you do not hear or understand myself or any of the parties to the proceeding, will you please let the court know? Yes. Mr. Kozak, have you had ample time to talk to your client? as well as with Ms. Hatton, along with Mr. Crumley's parents to proceed with an arraignment. Yes, Your Honor, and I appreciate Ms. Hatton's presence as well as uh, Mr. Crumley's parents. I appreciate the court's time and allowing us to get acquainted. Uh, Mr. Crumley was present for the swear to. He does not, if for purposes of arraignment, if the court wants me to proceed, I can at this point in time. Yes, okay. So then I'm going to, uh, Mr. Crumley, I'm going to uh, advise you of your rights uh, and the charges against you. Again, if at any time you do not hear or understand anything, will you please let the court know? Yes. You do have a right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Do you understand that right, sir? Yes, I do. All right. Count one does indicate that you did that uh, on or about November 30th, 2021, Ethan Robert Crumley did knowingly, willfully, deliberately, and with premeditation commit murder first degree, a violent a a felony that the defendant knew or had reason to know was dangerous to human life while intending to intimidate or coerce a civilian pop population to wit the Oxford High School community and cause the death of Madison Baldwin, Tate Meyer, Hannah St. Juliana and Justin Schilling, contrary to MCL 750.543F. This is a felony punishable by life without parole or a minimum of 25 to 40 years and a maximum sentence of at least 60 years with reimbursements for government ex expenses incurred for this violation. This is otherwise known as terrorism causing death. Count two indicates that on that same date and time, November 30th, 2021, Ethan Robert Crumley did deliberately with the intent to kill and with premeditation, kill and murder one Madison Baldwin, contrary to MCL 750.316. This is a felony like, that is punishable by life without parole or a minimum sentence of 25 to 40 years and a maximum sentence of at least 60 years. This is otherwise known as homicide or murder in the first degree, premeditated being a juvenile defendant. Count three alleges that on November 30th, 2021, Ethan Robert Crumley did deliberately with the intent to kill and with premeditation, kill and murder one Tate Meyer, contrary to MCL 750.316. This is a felony punishable by life without parole for a minimum sentence of 25 to 40 years and a maximum sentence of at least 60 years. Also known as homicide, murder, first degree, premeditated by a juvenile defendant. Count four alleges that on November 30th, 2021, and again, all of these, I'm sorry, are in the Ox township of Oxford. I, and I did indicate that, and I will continue to indicate that. That Ethan Robert Crumley did deliberately with the intent to kill and with premeditation, kill and murder one Hannah St. Juliana, Contrary to MCL 750.316, felony, life without parole, or a minimum sentence of 25 to 40 years, and a maximum sentence of uh, at least 60 years. And this is in violation of MCL 750, again, 0.316. This is homicide, murder, first degree, premeditated by a juvenile defendant. Count five alleges that on November 30th, Ethan Robert Crumley did in the township of Oxford deliberately with the intent to kill with premeditation, kill and murder Justin Schilling, contrary to MCL 750.316, a felony life without parole or a minimum sentence of 25 to 40 years and a maximum sentence of at least 60 years. This is called homicide, murder, first degree, premeditated by a juvenile defendant. 
Count six alleges that on November 30th, 2021, Ethan Robert Crumley did in Oxford Township make an assault on Phoebe Author with intent to commit the crime of murder, contrary to MCL 750.83. This is a felony punishable by up to life for any number of years, DNA to be taken upon arrest. A consecutive sentence may be imposed under MCL 750.506A if the assault was committed in a place of confinement. This is also known as assault with intent to murder. Count seven indicates that on November 30th, 2021, Ethan Robert Crumley, while in the township of Oxford, did assault, make an assault with, uh, upon John uh, Asciutto with intent to commit the crime of murder contrary to MCL 750.83. This is a felony punishable by life or any number of years, DNA to be taken upon arrest. This is also known as assault with intent uh, to commit murder. Count eight indicates that on November 30th, 2021, Ethan Robert Crumley did in Oxford Township make an assault upon Molly Darnell with the intent to commit the crime of murder contrary to MCL 750.83. This is a felony punishable by life for any number of years, and DNA to be taken upon arrest, also known as assault with intent to murder. Count nine alleges that on November 30th, 2021, Ethan Robert Crumley, while in the township of Oxford, did make an assault upon Riley Franz with intent to commit the crime of murder, contrary to MCL 750.83. This is a felony punishable by up to life or any number of years, DNA to be taken upon arrest. This is called assault with intent to murder. Count 10 alleges that on November 30th, 2021, Ethan Robert Crumley, while in Oxford Township, did make an assault upon Elijah Mueller with intent to commit the crime of murder. Contrary to MCL 750.83, a felony punishable while life for any number of years, DNA to be taken upon arrest. Also, again, assault with intent to murder. Count 11 alleges that on November 30th, 2021, Ethan Robert Crumley, while in Oxford Township, did make an assault upon Kylie Asage with the intent to commit the crime of murder, contrary to MCL 750.83. This is a felony punishable by life for any number of years. DNA to be taken upon arrest. Count 12 indicates that on November 30th, 2021, Ethan Robert Crumley, while in Oxford Township, did make an assault upon Aiden Watson with intent to commit the crime of murder, contrary to MCL 750.83. A felony punishable by life for any number of years and DNA to be taken upon arrest. This is also called assault with intent to murder. There are now 12 counts of possession of a firearm in the commission of uh, a felony. Counts 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, and 24. They do allege that on November 30th, 2021 in Oxford Township, Ethan Robert Crumley did carry or have in possession a firearm to wit a pistol at the time he committed or attempted to commit a felony to wit terrorism causing death. Um, also murder in the first degree uh, for count 14, murder in the first degree for count 15, murder in the first degree for count 16, murder in the first degree for count 17, assault with intent to commit murder for count 18, assault with intent to commit murder for count 19, assault with intent to commit murder for count 20, assault with intent to commit murder for count 21, assault with intent to commit murder for count 22, assault with intent to commit murder count 23, and assault with intent to commit murder count 24. This is contrary to the laws in the state, specifically MCL 750.227B. This is a felony punishable by up to two years consecutively, 
consecutively with and preceding any term of imprisonment imposed for the felony or attempt felony of conviction. This uh, is called possession of a firearm in the commission of a felony. Sir, do you understand all the charges against you? Yes, I do. Again, you have a right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Do you understand your right to remain silent? Yes. You also have, of course, your right to an attorney and Mr. Kozak and, uh, and Ms. Hatton have been with you and that right will continue uh, throughout uh, all uh, legal proceedings. Um, and as it relates to anything further, we do need to set a bond. Uh, as it relates to bond, uh, I will first let the, uh, actually we do have pretrial services here to make a recommendation as to bond. And then we will let each attorney speak uh, as it relates to that. So if the individual from pretrial services can come forward, state their full name and spell it for our reporter. I'm sorry, Judge, just before we do that, I just want to make sure it's clear that uh, my client is standing mute. We're asking the court to enter a not guilty plea. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I will enter a plea of not guilty on his behalf, and we will set this for bond. Thank you, Mr. Kosak. Darla Finley, Pretrial Services, D-A-R-L-A-F-I-N-L-E-Y. The defendant was unable to be interviewed due to his location at the Children's Village, therefore that we have limited information. Um, we do know that he's 15 years old, resident of Oxford. He's a sophomore at Oxford High School. He has no prior juvenile record, no noted police contacts in Clemens. Given the serious nature of the matter, um, there's no conditions or combinations of conditions which will assure the defendant's appearance in court or safety to the community at large. Therefore, we recommend that bond be denied. Thank you from pretrial services. Mr. Keast, anything you'd like to state? I would judge, thank you. Because the defendant is a juvenile charged as an adult, this court must look at Michigan Court Rule 6.909, subparagraph two. That court rule states that regarding detention without bail, if the proof is evident or if the presumption is great that the juvenile committed the offense, the magistrate or the court may deny bail subparagraph A, to a juvenile charge with first degree murder. Judge, in this case, I am asking this court to deny bail as pretrial supervision has indicated. As a um, offer of proof, I think it's appropriate for this court to have a brief chronology of what happened on November the 30th, 2021. As uh, you heard during the square two, Judge, Oxford High School is equipped with surveillance uh, video. We've had the opportunity to review that surveillance video just this morning. And what's depicted on that video, honestly, Judge, I don't have the words to describe how horrific that was that happened on November the 30th. It depicted just before 12.51 p.m., this defendant entering a bathroom with a backpack. A minute or two later, he exited the same bathroom without the backpack, but with a gun in hand. At that point, he methodically and deliberately walked down the hallway, aiming the firearm at students and firing. Right outside the bathroom, he, he began firing, Judge. After children started running away from the defendant, he continued down the hallway, again at a deliberate and methodical pace, pointing and aiming inside classrooms and at students who hadn't had the opportunity to escape. This continued on for four or approximately five minutes. The defendant went to another bathroom. As deputies arrived, he set the firearm down and he surrendered. Judge, a preliminary review of the defendant's social media accounts, his cell phone, as well as other document, document evidence recovered on scene showed that this defendant planned the shooting. He deliberately brought the handgun that day with the intent to murder as many students as he could. Judge, I believe no bond is appropriate. And again, like I stated at the appropriate time, I'd like to make a motion to transfer this defendant from Children's Village to the Oakland County Jail. Thank you. Mr. Kosak? Your Honor, understanding the, uh, the extreme nature of this case and understanding the, the circumstances at hand, uh, and, and having spoken to Mr. Crumbly as well as his parents, uh, I'm going to leave the, uh, the, bond, the setting of the bond and the, the discretion of the court. Thank you. Anything further for Ms. Hatton? Nothing further, Your Honor. I leave in the discretion of the court. 
Thank you. And I'm assuming you don't want your client to speak. That's correct, Your Honor, on both Mr. Kozak and my behalf. Thank you. Um, I do believe based upon all the information that's been provided to date that a no bond, a denial of bond is appropriate pursuant to uh, court rule and uh, I will order no bond on this case. Of, of course, your client does have a right to a preliminary exam within the statutory 21 time period, date time period, as well as a probable cause conference. I don't know if the court, the court should have set something or have we set something, do we know? Oh, it's on the front of the file? Okay. All right, a probable cause conference will be set on December 13th at 1.15 in front of myself, and then an exam the following week on December 20th at 1.15 again in front of myself. Anything further from the people or the defense? Thank you, Judge. I, I do have a motion for the court. The defendant's currently housed in Children's Village, if, if I may. Yes. Thank you, Judge. Under the same court rule, MCR 6.909, subparagraph B, regarding place of confinement. Subparagraph 2. On motion of a prosecuting attorney or a superintendent of a juvenile facility in which the juvenile is detained, the magistrate or court may order the juvenile confined in a jail or similar facility designed and used to incarcerate adult prisoners upon a showing that the juvenile's habits or conduct are considered a menace to other juveniles. Judge, in this case, I can't think of a more appropriate um, set of circumstances for a transfer from Oakland County Children's Village to the Oakland County Jail. Now this court must also look at the statute and that's MCL 764.27A. I spoke with Lieutenant Tim Willis, who is the officer in charge into the square two this afternoon. He has confirmed that the Oakland County Jail can house this defendant in a location out of sight and sound from adults. And that's the standard in the statute, Judge. Um, the Oakland County Jail is better equipped to handle this situation. They have done so in the past. They've done so in conformance with the statute. It is a more secure location. And I would ask that this court find that this defendant's conduct is a menace to juveniles by evidence of the simple fact that he targeted juveniles in this offense. Count one is a charge of terrorism uh, via murder, Judge. And the evidence that will come out of the preliminary examination and the subsequent trial will show that this was a planned event. It was methodical in its operation. And it was done so to terrorize, intimidate others in the community, Judge. I do believe the Oakland County Jail is the appropriate location to house this defendant. Thank you. Thank you. As it relates to that issue, Mr. Kosak and Ms. Hatt. Thank you, Your Honor. All due respect to Mr. Keist, Your Honor. Uh, I, and I, I want to remind the court, and I know the court doesn't need reminding, that these are allegations. He has not been found guilty of these, uh, of these issues or these charges as of yet. And uh, I'm asking the court to I'm objecting to the, the transfer at this point in time. I think the, uh, the children's village is more than capable of monitoring him and maintaining the safety of the other residents of that facility. Uh, and I think at this point, judge, if the court's going to consider this motion, I would ask the court to perhaps hold the ruling in abeyance until after the preliminary examination, at which point the court will have had a chance to have taken sworn and heard sworn testimony regarding these incidents. Regarding the, the Rega issue regarding itself the incident, or regarding the fact that he shouldn't be moved? Regarding regarding the incidents itself, the incidents itself, Your Honor, and because I, be, I believe that's what the prosecution is using as a reason for the transfer in and of itself, that that's evidence of the, the need to transfer. Thank you. Your Honor, just, just very briefly, this court has already found that the proof is evident under 6.909. And I know this is a preliminary showing. Obviously, defense has not had the opportunity to review discovery. Neither has this court. However, it is alleged in these 24 counts that this defendant didn't commit first degree murder upon anybody, but he targeted other juveniles. And I believe that 6.909 uh, subparagraph B is written specifically for a situation such as this. The Oakland County Jail is the appropriate location for this individual judge. 
It is, like I said, well equipped for this. They have the ability to keep this defendant separate from both sight and sound of other adults. Um, this is appropriate in these cir circumstances, Judge. Ms. Hatton, anything further? Anna, I concur in Mr. Kozak's argument. Um, I will advise the court that as Mr. Um, Ethan Crumley's uh, juvenile attorney, I did have an opportunity to speak again with Mr. Crum Ethan Crumley at the juvenile facility Children's Village, as well as the individuals who are um, supervising Mr. Crumley, um, Ethan Crumley at Children's Village. It's been reported to me, Your Honor, as an officer of the court, that Ethan has been cooperative. He is on suicide prevention there at Children's Village. He's not in general population. He's secluded and he's receiving one-on-one -on -one, um, supervision. I would ask the court, based on that information, and that he is cloaked in the veil of innocence unless proven guilty, that he remain at Children's Village until after the preliminary examination. Given that Children's Village is suitable and able to uh, maintain the safety of the other um, children at Children's Village, I believe it is appropriate at this time that Ethan remain at his current placement with the current um, conditions and supervisions in place until the preliminary um, exam, which is in a matter of days, December 20th, 2021, as this court has set. Thank you. I'm going to ask to hear from Lieutenant Willis regarding safety issues and what what is considered. If you want to come up to the podium, Lieutenant, and state your full name for us, please. Lieutenant Tim Willis. And Lieutenant Willis, um, I had heard from uh, Mr. Keese that you thought it was appropriate for him to be moved to uh, the adult facility. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Could you explain to me why you feel that way? Uh, the, the, well. I mean, besides the obvious of, of what is alleged to occur. Right. So obviously, I agree with Mr. Keys about the, the the incidents that I've witnessed for, um, via the video and all that stuff. But also, the, the sheriff's office in the past has housed several juveniles. Um, I've, I've actually worked in that jail and, and know for a fact that how um, I just have all the confidence in the world in, in my team, the, the, the sheriff deputies of the jail, to um, secure him and keep him um, completely sequestered. So how does that work? Explain what would happen to him and how he would, what the yeah, placement would be. Yes, Your Honor. We have several jail cells in and around, um, but uh, typically a we have a, where he would go, where he would be placed is the, our, a clinic area, and it's completely secluded off from the rest of, it's, it's, the only thing is there's a glass front door, but everything else is is bricked in. So it's completely private, completely back and away, and a deputy monitors um, him. So, so we have no contact whatsoever with any adult inmates. That, is that, that correct? That is correct, Your Honor. Okay. And he would be in there in that facility by himself. Correct. Right? And there would be no again, the only adults he would hear would be the deputies working there, but no, right. no inmates. Thank Not you. see them or hear them. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, under the circumstances and based upon the nature of this offense, uh, still, of course, understanding that the defendant has a right to be presumed innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, I'm going to certainly err on the side of caution. I think it is within the court rules to, to do so. And I would agree with uh, Mr. Keese. This is the perfect example of a case that should be done to protect other juveniles. So I will have him move to that facility as it has been indicated that he um, will be in isolation and that will be in will not be in contact with any other adult inmates, but only that of sheriff's deputies. Anything further? Not from the people, Judge. Thank you. Your Honor, I, the only other uh, matter would be making sure that he has counsel at the date of the probable cause conference. I'm not sure if the court has paperwork already prepared on his behalf, but he will need uh, court appointed counsel at that point. In time. So I'm not sure who the, uh, um, that is obviously is done by circuit court. Do we know what's going on in that regard? He will just need to fill out the court appointed attorney request, Judge, and oh. they will get counsel. Okay. So, all right, Mr. Crumley. We want to make sure that you have counsel at each and every future court date. So we're going to get, make sure you have that paperwork today to fill out so that you can make, so that you will have an attorney present 
at your probable cause conference, your preliminary exam, and all future proceedings. Do you have any questions about filling out that court appointed attorney form? No, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kosak. Okay. If there's nothing further. We are in recess. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Um, first, I'm going to start with Defense Counsel Mary L. Lehman and Shannon Smith. Do you hear the court? Yes, Your Honor. Good morning, Judge. Okay. Uh, Mark Keast from the Prosecutor's Office. Can you hear the court? I can. Thank you, Judge. I can. Jeff Rector from Pretrial Services. Can you hear the court? Yes, Your Honor. I can. Jennifer Crumley, can you hear the court? Yes, I can. Looks yep. like we're still yes. trying to get James Crumley set up there. Mr. James Crumley, can you hear and see the court? Yes. Okay. Uh, Karen McDonald, can you hear and see the court? Good morning, Judge. Okay, we're all set. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call these cases separately. Um, I'm going to call start starting with uh, People versus Jennifer Crumley, docket number 21006652. Can I have appearances on the record starting with the prosecutor? Karen McDonald, on behalf of the people of the state of Michigan. Mark Keast, on behalf of the people. Good morning, Your Honor. I'm Shannon Smith on behalf of Jennifer Crumbly. Good morning, Your Honor. Marielle Lehman on behalf of James Crumbly. I do want to address one issue first. Um, Ms. Lehman and Ms. Smith, um, you are practicing in the same firm, is that correct? Your Honor, that's correct. We have spoken to both of our clients about conflicts of interest. We have had in-depth conversations with them. Um, Marielle Lehman and I are representing both of them. We are representing James and Jennifer, and the conflict of interest um, question or issue has been very much discussed and resolved. And we believe at this time, ethically and professionally, we can continue on in this fashion. Okay, well, as you know, pursuant to MCR 6.005 subsection F1, you must state on the record the reasons that you believe joint representation in all probability will not cause a conflict of interest. So please state that for the record in accordance with the court rules. Thank you, Your Honor. After reviewing uh, the circumstances and facts of the case, and um, one of the things I need to make clear is that the media has very much been saturated with cherry picked facts. But when we have talked to our clients in depth and learned all of the circumstances of the case, which obviously are covered by attorney client privilege, there is not a conflict of interest between what happened without I cannot divulge to you the specific reasons, but there is not a conflict of interest um, between the parents, their defense. Um, and their defense strategy. Um, prosecutor, any uh, comments or statements you want to make relative to any potential conflicts of interest? Uh, Your Honor, I, I, you know, I, I'm not sure that there's any facts that have been placed on the record that that meets the standard. I, I'm not saying that I object, but I, I'm not sure that we have um, satisfied the court rule. Um, but I'm, if, if Mr. Keese has something to add. I'm, I, I am required to uh, inquire as to each defendant as well. Um, Jennifer Crumbly, do you have any objection to Ms. Lehman and Ms. Smith representing both you and Mr. Crumbly for this case, recognizing um, that uh, they come from the same firm and they will be representing both of you? I have no objection. Uh, Mr. Crumbly, likewise for you. Do you have any objection to both Ms. Lehman and Ms. Smith representing both you and Ms. Crumbly as it relates to this particular case? No objection, Your Honor. Do either of you have any questions or concerns about a potential conflict of interest? Mr. Crumbly? No. Ms. Crumbly? No. Okay. At this point, the court is satisfied that um, the both of the defendants um, are comfortable with both attorneys representing them in this case. 
The attorneys have indicated on the record that they do not believe that there is a conflict of interest and that they have spoken with both defendants in depth relative to any potential conflict of interest and whether or not their representation may jeopardize the right of each defendant to have the undivided loyalty of their lawyers. Therefore, the court will allow them to appear for purposes of the arraignment today um, on behalf of both defendants. Thank you, Your Honor. Right. Now, uh, in terms of the arraignment, Jennifer Crumbly, I'm going to arraign you first. So if you'll please make sure you get close to that microphone so that we can hear you. If at any time you cannot hear or see me, please put your hand up and we'll stop the proceedings and then try to figure out what's going on. Do you understand that you are charged with the following counts? Count one, involuntary manslaughter which is punishable by up to 15 years in prison and or up to a $7,500 fine and mandatory DNA for the death of Madison Baldwin. Do you understand that, Gerald? Do you understand that that is a charge for count one? Ms. Crumbly, you need to refer to your I understand. Do you understand that you are charged in count two for the death of Tate Meyer? involuntary manslaughter, which is punishable by up to 15 years in prison and or up to a $7,500 fine and mandatory DNA. I understand, I understand. Do you understand that you are charged in count three for the death of Hannah St. Juliana with involuntary manslaughter, which is punishable by up to 15 years in prison and or up to a $7,500 fine along with mandatory DNA testing? Understand. You understand that you're charged in count four for the death of Justin Schilling with involuntary manslaughter, which is punishable by up to 15 years in prison and or up to $7,500 fine along with mandatory DNA testing. Understand. Do you understand that you do have the right to plead guilty or not guilty to all those counts? I understand. I understand. And do you understand that you do have a right to a trial, either by jury or by judge? And at that trial, you would have the opportunity to call witnesses on your behalf, confront witnesses that have been called against you, and or to remain silent, and that you'd be presumed innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Do you understand all those trial rights? Yes, Your Honor. Are you on probation or parole for any other offense? Ma'am, I'll ask the question again. Are you on probation or parole no. for any offense? No. And how are you pleading to count one? Not guilty. How are you pleading to count two? Not guilty. How are you pleading to count three? Not guilty. How are you pleading to count four? Not guilty. The court will enter the pleas of not guilty for you for all four counts. Um, the court will set the probable cause conference, which is going to be on December 14th. Uh, Amy, what time do we have that one? Uh, you could do nine. That is December 14th at 1.15 p.m. The preliminary examination is scheduled for December 22nd at 9.45 a.m. Those will be in-person hearings. Your Honor, um, just as a matter for our file, are you assigned for the purpose of exam and the pre-exam, or is it, a, is it a different judge within the court? It is me. The okay, per perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address Bond in a minute. I'm going to go ahead and um, arraign Mr. James Crombley first. Mr. Thank James you. Crombley, you see, or, see and hear the court will pay. Yes. And do you understand, sir, that you are charged um, in count one for the death of Madison Baldwin of involuntary manslaughter, which is punishable by up to 15 years in prison and or up to a $7,500 fine and mandatory DNA testing? I understand. Do you understand in count two, you are charged with the death of Tate Meyer for the involuntary manslaughter, which is punishable by up to 15 years in prison and or up to a $7,500 fine and mandatory DNA testing? I understand. Do you understand that you are charged in count three for the death of Hannah St. Juliana, 
um, with the involuntary manslaughter, which is punishable by up to 15 years in prison and up to a $7,500 fine and mandatory DNA testing. I understand. And do you understand that you are charged in count four for the death of Justin Schilling, um, involuntary manslaughter, which is punishable by up to 15 years in prison and up to a $7,500 fine and mandatory DNA testing? I understand. Do you understand that you do have the right to plead either guilty or not guilty to all of those charges? I understand. Do you understand you have a right to a trial either by jury or by judge? And at that trial, you would have the opportunity to call witnesses on your behalf, confront witnesses that have been called against you and or to remain silent, and that you be presumed um, not guilty until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt for each and every element of the crime. Do you understand those trial rights? I understand. Are you on probation or parole for any other offense? No. How are you pleading to count one? Not guilty. How are you pleading to count two? Not guilty. How are you pleading to count three? Not guilty. And how are you pleading to count four? Not guilty. Again, the court will accept the plea of uh, not guilty for all four counts. This your case will also be scheduled for a probable cause conference on December 14th at 1.15 and a preliminary examination on December 22nd at 9.45 a.m. At this point, I'm going to address bond. Um, first, I'd like to hear from pretrial services. Thank you, Your Honor. Jeffrey Reckon for pretrial services. Uh, Ms. Gardner declined to speak with pretrial services and, respect, and request to speak with her attorney. As a result, no references were contacted and little background information is available. She's 43 years old and married. Her listed address with the jail is 112 East Street in Oxford, Michigan. Uh, she does not have any, she does have a prior criminal history. Uh, she uh, is not currently on probation or parole. She does not have a history of failing to appear. She does not have a prior documented history of violence. Uh, the charges against the defendant are severe, and are those charges uh, issued by the court, and along with the co-defendant, failed to turn themselves into authorities. Well, every defendant is afforded the presumption of innocence. The purpose of bail is to ensure appearance and the safety of the community. Uh, defendants in this matter had agreed through their attorney to turn themselves in to the court once charges were issued on 12-3 of 21. However, instead they fled. Based on the defendant's attempt to flee prosecution, Pretrial services has concerns for appearance and the safety of the public. It is our recommendation that a release on recognizance bail is not appropriate in this case. Uh, in order to further mitigate concerns for appearance and public safety, if the defendant makes release, the following conditions are respectfully recommended. Pretrial services supervision, the GPS tether prior to release, allowed to leave home for work if employed, medical appointments, attorney visits, uh, not to have any contact with any witnesses, victims, or return to Oxford High School, not to possess a firearm, and uh, must turn any firearms in that have not been confiscated. Thank you. Um, who is going to speak on behalf of the prosecutor's office? I am, Your Honor. Go ahead. Your Honor, I, I'm sure you've read the swear to you. Um, pursuant to MCR 6.106, uh, bond should be set with the considerations of the likelihood of conviction first. Here, the likelihood of conviction is strong. Your Honor, uh, we know from the facts and that were presented at the swear to you that uh, the Crumbleys, Mr. Crumbley, purchased this weapon for his son um, and that on the 27th, the, the uh, Mrs. Crumbley went to the shooting range with her son, posted on social media saying that it was a mother Sunday and that she was, um, she bought a weapon for her, a, a gun for her baby for Christmas. Uh, it, it's also clear from the facts that he had um, total access to this weapon and that it was it was for him. Uh, second, on the 29th, both defendants were aware that he was searching ammunition um, on his phone at school. Instead of um, reacting to that as a concerned parent and worried about safety, uh, Mrs. Crumbley texted, LOL, <clears throat> just I'm not mad, just next time don't get caught. Um, and then obviously on this very tragic day on the 30th, they were called to the school and about their uh, son's uh, um, drawing, which clearly depict, depicted threats and acts of violence. And instead of disclosing to the school that he had full access to this weapon, 
They chose not to. They chose not to take their son home. They chose not to tell anybody that he might be dangerous when it was clear and they had every likelihood that, that he was. And instead they left. Um, furthermore, after the active shooting announcement went out, Mrs. Crumbly texted her son, Ethan, don't get, don't do it. And Mr. Crumbly went to his home purposely to search for this weapon because he was afraid his son had the weapon and was in fact shooting people and hurting them, which as we know is exactly what happened. Your Honor, this is a very serious, horrible, terrible murder and shooting, and it has affected the entire community. And these two individuals could have stopped it. And they had every reason to know that he was dangerous and they gave him a weapon and they didn't secure it and they allowed him free access to it. Furthermore, Your Honor, uh, the purpose of bond is to secure further court appearances. And yesterday, uh, they were charged with these counts of mans voluntary manslaughter. Uh, now, Your Honor, the, the communication between Mrs. Smith and the prosecutor's office was a text message that uh, was sent to me and was um, not replied to. Um, and you know, we don't have an obligation to cooperate. And there are good reasons for that. And I think they, the, the fact that the, the events that played out show the reasons for that. Now, Mrs. Smith, clearly her clients did not give her, tell her the truth because her representation was they wanted to turn themselves in and that they were um, on their way to do that. Um, however, they didn't turn themselves in and uh, we were told they were out of town, except that yesterday morning they withdrew uh, $4,000 from an ATM in Rochester Hills, uh, very close to the court where they could have turned themselves in with no um, events and no uh, um, efforts on behalf of law, law enforcement. Instead, they fled and they, they sought multiple attempts to hide their location and were eventually tracked down after they uh, parked their car somewhere, a witness saw it and the entire fugitive apprehension team with multiple other law enforcement agencies went into a uh, vacant building and searched it from top to bottom. And these two individuals were found locked somewhere in a room hiding. These are not people that we can be assured will return to court um, on their own. And then lastly, pursuant to MCR 6.106, we also should consider, or the court should consider, um, whether or not there are members of the community to vouch. There are none here. In fact, there are none here because there are there is not one person in that community that will vouch for these two defendants. So I'm asking that you set a five hundred thousand dollar bond for both defendants, cash surety. Um, let's. Uh, I'd like to hear from the attorneys. Uh, please address bond as it relates to Jennifer Crumbly. First, please. Um, Your Honor. The first thing I need to do is to respond to the prosecution's comments about our contact with their office. On Thursday night, I texted Karen McDonald and told her my office was representing the Crumbleys and we and I wanted to speak with her. She did text back and said we could talk first thing Friday morning. First thing Friday morning, I did text Miss McDonald. I also group texted Miss McDonald with Mario Lehman. I also called her office. I talked to her personal secretary and explained who I was, the circumstances, and that I needed to speak with Miss McDonald. Marielle Lehman also called Miss McDonald in the morning. We called the prosecutor's office throughout the day and never got a call back. We were going to make arrangements to have our clients turn themselves in. I was in a trial in circuit court in front of Judge Savin all day yesterday. Ms. Lehman was traveling on a plane from Florida up to Michigan. The prosecutor's office, instead of getting back to us in any way, decided to have a press conference and as Ms. McDonald admitted, try to find a way to, uh, to surprise our clients and catch them off guard when it was so unnecessary. And last night and throughout the day, we were in contact with our clients. They, they were scared, they were terrified, they were not at home. They were figuring out what to do, getting finances in order. 
and the last text messages we had with them and phone calls Marielle Lehman and I had with them, our plan was to drive to the Novi District Court this morning because arraignments were supposed to start at 830 for any county arraignment. And we had plans to meet them at 730 to text the fugitive apprehension team to get to the court by 830 so they could be arraigned first thing. Those were plans we made and solidified and we did not announce it because unlike the prosecution, we weren't attempting to make this a media, a media spectacle. This case is absolutely the saddest, most tragic, worst case imaginable. There is absolutely no doubt, but our clients were absolutely going to turn themselves in. It was just a matter of logistics and all the prosecution had to do was communicate with me about it. And we tried multiple times. All right, that being said, with respect to Ms. Um, Crumbly, she is 43 years old as pretrial services told you she has been employed as the director of a large um, company director of marketing um, she is a she grew up in clarkston prior to living in oxford where they've owned their home since 2015 she lived in lake orion she has never been in serious trouble with the law she does have a drunk driving conviction back from when she was in college any conviction on Ms. Crumbly's record is a misdemeanor and, and is old. Um, Ms. Crumbly has um, retained my office and Marielle, obviously. She would not have done that had she planned to not turn herself in and fight these charges. I'm quite certain they would not have paid my office money and, and taken those steps if they were not going to fight these charges. When it comes to the seriousness of the offense, when you listen to the prosecution's facts they're presenting, which are incomplete, very incomplete, it does sound like an, an absolutely egregious uh, wrongdoing on the part of Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly that they, that they gave their child a gun and encouraged him to do this. That's just not the case. And Mrs. Crumbly is presumed innocent. And I asked this court, to know that to note that full discovery has not been available and that the court is only aware of the facts the prosecution has presented but that gun was actually locked so when the prosecution is stating that this child had free access to a gun that is just absolutely not true and we need an opportunity to fight this case in court and not in the court of public opinion we need the opportunity to have our clients' constitutional rights to being presumed innocent protected. And this court is going to see um, in the exam in particular that there is far more going on than what this court has been made aware of. And for that reason, Your Honor, I would ask this court to set bond, keeping all of that in mind. Our clients would absolutely be avail themselves to a GPS tether they would absolutely obey all of the conditions listed by pretrial services. This case does not warrant a $500,000 bond. I would ask this court in light of the criminal history, the limited facts um, presented to order that the bond be set at $50,000 um, or $100,000 if this court believes it needs to be more. Um, our clients are going to fight these charges. Our clients are just as devastated as everyone else. Um, bond has to come from a place of legal soundness, not emotional reaction, which has driven this entire case. And it is emotionally charged. It is emotionally the worst thing I have ever been involved with and seen. There is no doubt it is the worst thing the Crumbleys have ever been involved with and seen. And there is just so much going on here and we ask the court to set a reasonable bond. Um, any additional comments as it relates to James Crumbly? Yes, Your Honor. Um, James is 45 years old. He has a prior um, conviction from 2004. Again, similar to Jennifer Crumbly, any convictions that he has would have been, um, we believe that they were misdemeanors. He does not have any substance abuse issues. He does have some health issues that require um, 
he's diabetic that required two types of insulin. He was gainfully employed. Um, he's been in, in Michigan since he and Jennifer moved up here several, several years ago. Um, as for the seriousness of the charges, as Ms. Smith has stated, the facts that have, that have been presented by Ms. McDonald and her office have been cherry picked to further her narrative of making an example of Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly, which she very freely said she was doing yesterday during her press conference. Again, to echo what Ms. Smith has said, I personally contacted Ms. McDonald's office to notify her of mine and Ms. Smith's availability. She chose not to call us back. I was also in communication with law enforcement, as was Ms. Smith. They knew that we were planning to bring Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly in. They knew that we were in communication with them, contrary to what was presented in the media. Um, Your Honor, they hired our office on Thursday. They have been, we are prepared to defend this case. They are absolutely taking this case seriously. They are devastated by the events in the Oxford, um, in the Oxford incident. Um, this is not something that's being taken lightly by them or us, Your Honor. I agree with Ms. Smith, $500,000 is not warranted in this case. The charges are very seriously, but as the court is aware, they are allegations at this point. As Ms. Smith has stated, both of our clients are presumed innocent unless they're proven guilty, um, Your Honor. And quite frankly, from what we know, Your Honor, the facts are not what they've been presented to the court and to the public. So I, I, I again echo what Ms. Smith indicated. Our clients are more than happy to um, have a GPS tether, to be on pretrial, pretrial services supervision. I am re again requesting a $50,000 or $100,000 bond but Mr. Crumbly, as with Mrs. Crumbly, is not a flight risk. She is not a, he is not a danger to the community. There is no risk that they're going to flee prosecution. They were never fleeing prosecution. I want to make that very clear with the court. We had been in communication with the prosecutor's office and law enforcement and our clients throughout yesterday, Your Honor. They were not fleeing prosecution, contrary to the media reports. Um, so, Your Honor, I'm asking that they have a $50,000 or $100,000 bond with a GPS tether and pretrial services supervision. Your Honor, may I respond, please? Very, very quickly, please. Your Honor, um, I agree with Mrs. Smith on one thing. The court hasn't heard all the facts, and neither has the public, because I have an ethical duty not to release those facts, because she is indeed correct. Her client and um, Mr. Crumbly have a, um, an absolute, um, we have a burden, and they, they these are merely allegations. So I agree. And I just want to point out, um, nobody needs permission these, these defendants did not need my permission and they didn't need law enforcement permission to go to the court and turn themselves in, go to the police department, the sheriff's department and turn themselves in. I agree Mrs. Smith was, was perhaps in trial. She had a break from 1145 to 245. And I can't imagine why they were surprised. The, the whole country knew that these charges were coming. And lastly, to suggest that this anyone has somehow using this incident to, um, to create press there's a lot of attention here because four children were murdered and seven others were injured. And that that is on the mind of every single person in this country. So I would ask that you impose the $500,000 cash surety on each of the defendants, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, so in terms of bond, the court is required to comply with MCR 6.106. The purpose of bond is to ensure that the, uh, the defendants appear in court for all necessary court appearances, as well as uh, to take into consideration any risk to public safety. Um, obviously, these charges are very, very serious. There's no question about that. Um, there is a there's the court does have some concern about the flight risk, along with the public safety, given the circumstances that occurred yesterday and the fact that the defendants did have to be apprehended um, in order to appear for purposes of arraignment. The court did indicate yesterday after the swear to that it would be conducting an arraignment at 4 p.m. Um, and nobody appeared for purposes of that arraignment. Your so Honor, I, reasons, if, if, Your Honor, I may, if you see it. The bond for Jennifer Crumbly at $500,000 cash surety, no 10%. In the event that Jennifer Crumbly is able to post bond, the following conditions will, uh, will be in place. The defendant is not to use or test positive for alcohol, recreational marijuana, or any controlled substances. Um, Ms. Crumbly is not to possess or have in her possession any firearms, um, or dangerous weapons, shall not have any assaultive behavior toward anyone, must provide a release address upon release to the pretrial services um, representative. The uh, pretrial services representative will be monitoring bond compliance. 
The defendant upon within 24 hours of release from the Oakland County Jail must submit to and pay for ETG, PBT, or urinalysis um, at a facility that's open seven days a week that automatically lab confirms all positives, provides all levels in writing. Um, that would be at the direction of PTS. The, the defendant, Ms. Crumbly, at this time is to verify any employment status um, and verify that in writing upon release from the Oakland County Jail. In the event that the defendant, Ms. Crumley, is able to post a bond, the court is going to require that she have a GPS tether. Um, the GPS tether upon, must be installed upon release um, from the Oakland County Jail. She may be, the GPS tether will have the allowances that she could um, go to work, attend court hearings, medical appointments, and attorney meetings. She must provide work schedule, medical appointments, and any meetings to PTS in advance. Again, that must be installed at the jail before she leaves the jail. As it relates to James Robert Crumbly, the court is setting a $500,000 cash surety, no 10% bond. Um, the defendant is not to use or test positive for alcohol, recreational marijuana, or any controlled substances. Um, the, the defendant is not to possess or have in his possession any firearms, weapons, or, or ammunition. The defendant is not to have assaultive behavior toward anyone. The defendant must provide a release address if he is able to post bond to pretrial services. He will be monitored by pretrial services, must submit and pay for ETG, PBT, and a urinalysis within 24 hours of release from the Oakland County Jail at a facility that is open seven days a week that automatically lab confirms all positives, provides all levels in writing. The defendant must verify employment to PTS upon release from the Oakland County Jail. The GPS tether must be installed prior to release from the Oakland County Jail in the event that the defendant is able to post bond. He also must provide um, information relative to employment schedule, medical appointments, or any other appointments that are allowed, which will include, he could attend court hearings, employment, medical appointments, and attorney meetings. Any violations of any of the terms and conditions of those bond um, may result in revocation of bond. Any questions as it relates to bond for James Crumbly? Your Honor, we have no questions, but I do need to place one thing on the record. I'm not asking the court to change anything. What I want to state on the record is I was not able to watch the entire press release and what the, I, I had no idea there was a four o'clock arraignment. Ms. Lehman didn't know either. The media had so many reports of random times that quite frankly, we didn't believe also, there was- I, also, we're not gonna get into- I just um, wanna uh, apologize to the court because we weren't aware. And also we faxed over appearances and no one told us like, hey, we're gonna do this at four o'clock. We sent appearances late in the day. And I, I just apologize to this court because we don't miss dates. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, finally, as it relates to um, bond, the in the event that uh, the defendants do post bond, I am requiring that they turn over any and all weapons um, to the Oakland County Sheriff's Office. That must occur um, within. Realistically, I, I, I'm i not sure what they have in their possession or if they're going to be able to be, where they're going to be released to if they, they post bond, but I am going to require that they turn over all weapons upon release from the Oakland County Jail. Okay, um, any other questions? No, thank you. No, Your Honor. Thank you. All right, again, the PCC is on the 14th at 1.15. Preliminary examination is on the 22nd at 9.45 a.m. It will be in-person proceedings. Please make sure that you are prepared with all witnesses and or exhibits. You and I just do want to put on the record that um, there are hundreds and hundreds of hours of digital evidence and voluminous documents, um, and we are compiling it and we'll get it to defense um, counsel as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, Your Honor. Have a nice day. Thank you, Judge. You too. Your Honor.